I'm Heinbach and it's good to have you back. What I'm playing here is an absolute unicorn of a synthesizer, the Synkit from 1963. This is probably the only one that is still playable and I got to record a whole album with it at the Museo del Synth Marchigiano. More on that album and the vinyl pre-order at the end of this video. But for now, here's the story of the Synkit. This is one of the first synthesizers in history, let's say. Came at the same time uh, Don Bacla and Robert Mook did their uh, synthesizers. But it has a very different history because it's not meant as an instrument for musicians, but for composers of uh, cinema soundtracks. The project started from earlier experiments with the phonosynth which was a sort of studio in an instrument uh, built for cinema. And all this work was done by Paolo Ketov, who was an Italian engineer. Uh, he was in Rome and worked a lot with the cinema industry. So he started uh, being a technician and then a sound engineer. And then he started building instruments for, for the soundtracks. Actually, it's made out of tube uh, circuits, mm -hmm. so it is amazingly uh, small for being vacuum tube circuits. It was also used for a lot of performances all around Europe and the US. The power supply is slightly big. Yes. <laughs> so that's a, a chunky one. This was made uh, from Ketov for this musician with jazz musician called uh, Bill Smith. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, he played the clarinet. Mm -hmm. This kind of uh, synchet is the only one with the two in for the instrument, for fi filtering the instrument. After uh, Bill Smith, uh, a girl uh, from USA, she bought this from from him, and he play a lot. She she play a lot with John Eaton, mm -hmm. and with another girls doing this uh, experimental music with piano and filtering in the sink with tape.
I was involved in a lot of recitals and I was playing always the mini moog and I liked that little instrument but you know it's it's it can't do what the sin cat can do and and I loved playing the sin cat and I just wanted to have my own because I knew I could do a lot more different things And this unit was also in the Darmstadt School of uh, uh, Summer School of Music and was played by Stockhausen. And she, she told in an interview uh, also Ligeti put, put the hands on it. How many of these were built? Because I've never seen another one of these ever. Probably eight or nine of, of, uh, of them. Just uh, someone said eight, someone said nine. But this is probably the one that you can play. Uh -huh. because the the only one, one that you can play. Yeah. Yeah, because the uh, two of them is in in museum, mm -hmm. one in, in the museum of Rai uh, Radio Televisione Italiana in Milan, and another one in the uh, museum so, of music. Deutsches, Deutsches, Deutsches museum. museum of Munich. Okay. Yeah, and uh, another one is in the Santa Cecilia Auditorium, and it, it was used just once, and now is uh, is put in the museum. These instruments are built like custom for each uh, customer that bought it. So each one has a, its own voice. What they have in common, it's subtractive synthesis, but kind of weird. So it's got oscillators, but then it doesn't have a simple filter. It has a lot of filter because each oscillator has two filters. And then there's a filter bank, an octave filter bank, which is maybe strange for today's standards, but at the time for the electronic music studios, we are talking about the 60s, they still had a lot of radio equipment, so a filter bank was sort of common at the time. It doesn't have uh, the articulation with an ADSR, but it has three modulators which can build cyclical patterns, and that's also very uh, peculiar of this instrument. I found it very hard to make this drone <laughs> because <laughs> these are so funky. Like yeah. all these have different shapes. The top one is percussive. This one is a little bit softer. This one has like a slow thing yeah. going, and they all create. It's really. Yeah, it's fun to create patterns with this, I have to say.
And then we've got this wonderful mini key keyboard, <laughs> like the first mini key keyboard. <laughs> it wasn't a micro cork. It was meant not to be used as a keyboard, but to add modulations because the keys have several contacts that enable uh, all the different modulations at least when it's in pristine conditions. We don't know what's pristine condition yeah, in yeah. this case. Yeah. When Paolo Ketov uh, sold it to the, his customers, he didn't give them the schematics. No. It just gave them a block diagram. It's really hard to say how should this instrument mm -hmm. be in its mint condition. So we don't know exactly. We have to do a lot of work of research mm -hmm. and it's not really easy nowadays. That must be a nightmare to service then. Yes. So, he knows. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, when you turn this on, it never play like you left the last time. Very jealous of the of the schematics, so there is um, mail between him and one customer, and he have to ask three times to, to give the schematics because it's very hard to repair on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a, a part of, of the schematic that Linda gave to us, and it, it is very interesting because uh, there is no a complete one, but with with this part and and the other part, we are able to understand what what really everything is doing. Who knew about the circuit? Was it well known at the time? Were other synthesizer makers or builders like aware that the circuit existed? There is uh, many mail between Robert Moog and Paul uh, Ketov because uh, Moog tried to bring Ketov in Trunemalburg to work with him. Moog found this, this uh, synthesizer very interesting. Uh, did he develop anything further after the Syncut? Any other synthesizers or instruments? Uh, no, he, t he tried to do a last one, which is the Syncut 7279. Uh, he got this name probably for the years in was he developing. It, it disappeared and there is a photo and now uh, I, I read on on a book that the, f the family had this uh, prototype and uh, Santa Cecilia is trying to rebuild and make it working. It's quite more similar to a synthesizer that, that we know now, mm -hmm. quite similar to a mini MOOC with a keyboard and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the panel with all the knobs and things. And you do some, some mixer and some things for the, for the cinematic studios, mm -hmm. but no more synthesizer. Mm -hmm. that yeah that 
uh, a very cinematic tone to it. You can really yeah. hear that. It just yeah. it just glides under. I can just imagine using it to score something because it just fits so well with the cinematic texture. Try to find around YouTube a film. The name is H2S. Uh -huh. Uh, Morricone do the soundtrack for for this film, which is a very dystopic, strange cool. 70 uh, film, and it was all made with the synths. Cool. I'll uh, throw that link up here yeah. somewhere so you guys <laughs> can watch it. I loved playing with the synthet. It's one of the most powerful and expressive synthesizers I've ever heard. It is like a test equipment studio shrunk into a little case. I enjoyed the recordings that I made there so much that I decided to release them as an album called Synced Studies. And that album is available now as digital and there is a vinyl campaign going on right now. Which means if you want a vinyl, you can order it right now from Bandcamp directly. And that's the only way to get the vinyl for now. And only if the campaign succeeds. So I hope enough of you are interested. Especially because Portuguese artist Zé Bernet made a wonderful cover that I'm so proud of. Thank you all for watching and listening. And if you have any questions, do put them in the comments below. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.